everyone. I'm Marilyn CEO and founder of Cosmic Centaurs Leadership Development and Organizational Development Consultancy. Today, you are joining us for our third online event of this year's edition of the Cosmic Conference. And this event is part of our two month long, you heard it right, two month long conference all about leadership polarities titled The Cosmic Dance Mastering Dualities in Leadership. We've been running the Cosmic Conference for five years now. This is our fifth edition. And one of our principles is sharing what we learn with the world and with, with as many people as possible. And every year, we try to choose a theme that resonates with the leaders we work with. From navigating remote work, managing hybrid teams, to designing effective employee experiences, to strategy execution, and building organizations that deliver, those have been the themes of the past. This year, we've chosen a timeless theme to help leaders master a key skill for navigating in a complex world, the topic of polarities. Now, all leaders, whether they've been in the C-suite for decades or are first-time managers, are navigating seemingly opposing demands. Present versus future, people engagement versus performance, growth versus profit, the list goes on. And repositioning ourselves on these spectrum is really a daily task. It's taxing, it takes a lot of energy, and sometimes we default to one side. And we've all met or been some of these leaders, the chaotic entrepreneur, the inflexible CFO, the soft leader or the tactical manager. But great leaders know that their superpower comes from developing range, and this ability to dance along the spectrum is what drives sustainable organizational growth. They go from either or mentality that traditional education teaches us to a both and mentality that allows them to thrive in a complex world. Today, our guests, Ayub and Janine, will offer us a new approach to leading organizational change in today's complex and uncertain world, moving beyond traditional change management tools to leverage relational skills, systems thinking, and facilitation techniques. The session is going to be a facilitated session, mostly between Ayub and Janine, and I will leave the floor to them in just a few minutes. We love these formats because they break the mold of traditional keynotes and Q&As. Um, and I will hand it over to them. And later on, about 45 minutes in, I'll jump back in with my own questions, but also yours. So please drop any questions or comments you have in the chat box, and I'll make sure to curate them, and we'll get to them at the end of the session today. Now, let me introduce our guests officially. Joining me are Ayub Saman and Janine Weber. Janine is the executive director of Teach for Lebanon, where she leads efforts to drive educational impact in the region. With degrees in politics and sociology and education for sustainable development, Janine has extensive experience in NGO leadership, human rights, and strategic development regionally and globally. Her passion for development extends to co-founding youth and environmental initiatives and chairing an NGO for children with disabilities. Ayub is an executive coach and partner at Cultivating Leadership, where he designs development programs for executives and boards across the GCC, Europe, the US, and South Asia. Ayub holds an MBA from Stanford, a master's in energy economics, and an engineering degree from Polytechnique. He is also chairing the board of Teach for Lebanon and an executive director at Shumuli. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you All so right. much, Mary. And with that, I will take myself out of the live and leave the stage to both of you. And I look forward to everything we're going to learn from this beautiful conversation. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shani. And my name is Ayu. Thank you, Marilyn, for the introduction. Yeah, so we decided to embrace the idea of dualities in leadership and speak as uh, two people rather than as one. The first duality that we will encounter is in the roles that uh, Ayub and I play. I'm the full time, full time dedicated executive director of Teach for Lebanon, an educational NGO that serves Lebanese students, and Ayub is the chair of TFL. We like to think that each from their own perspective and role partner with one another to ensure that TFL can increase access to education to children in Lebanon. We are not alone in this partnership. We serve thousands of children and families, more than 70 public schools and semi-private schools with hundreds of fellows and education professionals coordinated by more than 30 staff members and eight board members. We hope today that we strike two birds with one stone 
um, which is another duality, and talk about leading change in uncertainty and to raise awareness about TFL's work and education in Lebanon in general. Thank you very much, Janine. I'm so grateful for your presence here and for all the work you've been doing at TFL along with all of our colleagues, the fellows and our partners. And thank you to Cosmic Centaurs for inviting us and letting us experiment with this format. Um, this was supposed to be a keynote and uh, I was all geared up to speak about leading change in uncertainty. Um, I have been accompanying and advising executives and leadership teams on tricky questions on their minds for 15 years. And in the past two years, one question seems to return again and again and again in my clients' requests. It goes like this. Everything is changing. There's a new strategy. There's a new organization structure. There's rotating leadership. Uh, plenty of things keep moving. We are certain that more change is coming, but we don't know what and we don't know when. How can we lead change when there's so much uncertainty ahead? Can we have a plan? We need a strategy, we need a plan. Uh, I have come to love this question. My, my colleague, Alice Evans, um, uh, wrote once that when we are in deep uncertainty, uh, we want to really love the problem that we're facing because it's going to spend time with us. Uh, and I have loved trying to answer it with clients and my colleagues uh, for the past 15 years. I've had the pleasure and the horror of seeing the good, the bad, and the most boring of what has variously been labeled as change management, organizational transformation, culture change, and many other equally exciting monikers. In this talk, I prefer to play on another duality, which is I'd like to speak from my role as a facilitator, as a coach, as a, an advisor, and from my role as a leader trying to lead change in uncertainty. Uh, this is a, um, I've been involved with Teach for Lebanon for seven years. I've been the chair of the board for three. Uh, I've worked with uh, Janine since she joined us uh, nearly two years ago, and I've worked with um, her predecessor, Salim Samarani and TFL's founder, uh, Ali Dimashkiye. Um, and this is probably the most difficult thing uh, I do. And I know the difficulty that uh, my colleagues at TFL uh, are involved in. So my hope is that this setup of Janine and I being here in front of you today uh, will lead me away from dry theoretical stuff. And I can do a lot of that. Um, and that it will make your experience more lively. Uh, it will make the learnings that we have more practical. And ideally, that we can promote TFL's work a little bit. Uh, Janine and I have a plan for you today, uh, and I'll ask Marilyn to pull up the slides if that's possible. Um, if it works, if our plan works, you will get three things. Uh, you'll get a fresh look at leading change in uncertainty through the lens of polarities. You will also get a set of competences that can support you or that can support others in leading change in uncertainty. And finally, you will get real examples uh, to follow through and the live examples of these competences in practice. Um, and that's important because we will not be offering a recipe, rather we will be offering a set of things that we want to do again and again and again. And so you'll see Janine and I do these maybe once or twice today, and hopefully you can take that into your lives. Um, Janine and I are taking a risk here. It's the first time we do such a thing. We love TFL and we want the best for it. So if we do something that excites you, please find a way to support Teach for Lebanon and its mission. Um, find us on LinkedIn, find us on our website, uh, promote Teach for Lebanon uh, if and when you can. Uh, if you can, if you're so inclined, please donate. Uh, you will learn a little bit about what we do now and we are very excited to tell you more about it whenever you like and if we mess up in this talk please forgive us and uh, please continue supporting each other um, we won't need the slide for a little while now uh, with the setup Janine, could you kindly help us set the scene um, and maybe briefly in a few minutes tell us a little bit about what is tfl and then what does it mean for you to be leading change in uncertainty?
It's a local NGO and we are partner in a global network, Teach for All network. Our main mission is to provide access to quality education to all children in Lebanon, irrespectively of their socioeconomic backgrounds. And our main model uh, is the fellowship model. So we invite young and highly competent graduates to a two-year fellowship program in which they train as teachers and go to public and semi-private schools to teach there. And um, they are not only teaching children, they are also making connections with other teachers, with the principals, and they are widely influencing the entire ecosystem of the school. They often introduce skills to students such as social emotional learning and artistic skills. And um, we train our fellows in uh, these competencies, also in trauma sensitive teaching and healing classrooms, all these um, techniques which are really, really important looking at the current situation in Lebanon. So TFL has been operating for 15 years and we have now more than 250 alumni um, who are making a real difference in Lebanon and in the world. And for the past two years, we have increased the number of fellows to 100, hoping to continue increasing um, the support we can give to education in general in Lebanon. Um, recently, we had a change to our core program because we added um, two very interesting programs which are um, grounding up what we are doing and which are supporting our mission. One is the Call and Learn program. It's a telephone hotline staffed by experienced teachers and um, children and um, uh, out-of-school kids all of them can call the hotline, get direct support for teaching, studying and learning, sometimes over a period of three months. And we have meanwhile received more than 60,000 calls in our piloting and project phase. So that's really, really encouraging feedback. And um, we do this together with UNICEF, who is uh, our support in that. Um, the second program we do is an English learning program and um, it's called Access. And it's supporting around 500 students each year, which are brilliant, but which don't have usually access to English learning um, in the country. So the education ecosystem in Lebanon has seen a lot of changes in the past 40 years. Um, and we have an ongoing story of challenges and successes. The past five years have been particularly changing and challenging to every one of us. So those who are unfamiliar with Lebanon, since 2019, the country has seen a political revolution, a financial crisis, the Beirut port explosion in 2020, the consequences of COVID, the breakdown of political and financial institutions. And since October 2023, we are facing an escalating uh, war. So uh, now in this situation, we have approximately 1,200 public schools and more than 900 are now shelters, which means they are hosting internally displaced people by the war. You can imagine that there are very, very little spaces left where children can traditionally receive education. The school year has officially started two days ago and it's still unclear how teaching will be delivered to most of the students in the country. Through all of this, um, we had to survive, thrive and transform in service of the children we teach. And until now, things have worked out relatively well. So first of all, we're still here um, and we've been growing. So we cultivated trust to new partners, new donors and funding institutions. We are proud to partner with some of the largest universities in Lebanon and with some of the most trusted global institutions. Yet, when we look ahead, um, things are foggy and um, there's an uncertainty. So we know that we must change to become more professional, more agile, more sustainable. And often we don't even know who might make it to the office tomorrow morning, whether our fellows will find a school where they can teach in person or not. So we deeply care about the people in our community and that invites us to slow down even when we want to accelerate and that is not the easiest thing to do so uh, that's what leading and change uh, leading change and uncertainty looks like for 
for me as the executive director of TFL. Um, thank you, Janine. Um, I feel so proud of the work that you do and that all of our colleagues do day in, day out. I know it's really, really difficult. And I want to say that uh, um, Janine and I are aware that by bringing a real life example of a place that is right now at war, uh, this may not always, this is not easy for us to talk about uh, without marginalizing some experiences. And we also might be, um, um, this might be provocative to some people who are listening to us. There are some people who might get um, excited if they have a link uh, to Lebanon or to education. And there are people who might be, um, who might feel overwhelmed by the amount of, uh, uh, of things that are going on. I certainly feel uh, overwhelmed every day. And I, part of my work is to um, try to move the overwhelm into something uh, that is creative and productive. So for those who are with us today, thank you for being with us and thank you for staying with us. Um, from where I stand, I experienced some of the things that you just talked about, Janine. Um, with um, my colleagues on the board, um, we try to enable and support your team. We try to invite broad and long-term perspectives. We ensure that TFL has all it needs to operate sustainably. Some of it is... Uh, thanks to a pull on invitation from uh, Janine and her uh, staff and the fellows. For example, we make uh, we are available to step in and help in coaching, recruiting, fundraising, uh, connecting. And some of it is more uh, push from the board. We ask for certain changes or a strategic direction. Um, sometimes we say no to things and uh, sometimes we say yes to a lot of things. So now that we're here, uh, I'd like us to bring some things together. Um, this, this talk about is about leading change of, in uncertainty. And leading change in uncertainty is really, really hard. Uh, as a matter of fact, if of each of those words taken by itself uh, can be really, really hard. Leading is hard. It's often ruthless. It's always challenging. Uh, change is hard. It is experienced by people as hard. It's often labeled uh, as unsuccessful. And there's always pressure uh, created by change in organizational systems and in relationships and in individuals. Uncertainty is, for most people, most of the time, scary and stressful. We won't spend too much time saying how we know these things, how we know that these things are hard. There's a lot of literature that talks about this. My favorite places to go for that are the books and publications of my colleagues at Cultivating Leadership. Um, check out the work of Jennifer Garvey Berger. Um, she recently published the second edition of her book, Changing on the Job, which is amazing and which you will love. Um, Jennifer and Keith Johnson um, have written a book about simple habits for complex time that talk about complexity and how we could lead in complexity. And Jennifer and Carolyn Coughlin uh, re recently published a uh, co-authored a book on uh, how to unleash uh, complexity genius. So what are the habits that we can develop to be um, more at ease in complexity? Um, now let's go back to the problem of leading change in uncertainty. And I'm using the word problem deliberately. Because that's how I often get asked the question. That is how a lot of the work out there, a lot of the thinking, a lot of the methods out there address this question. The things that come up a lot in, um, that I see at least in management literature, but also in the corporate world and the organizational world, they all have an idea of let's make a plan. Let's set point A, set point B, and go from A to B. Let us launch a series of initiatives and monitor their progress and measure the progress. Let us make big interventions. Let us do a, a reorg. Let us hire more people. Let us um, uh, maybe let go of people. Let's bring in specialists. Let's measure something. 
Uh, all of these things are wonderful. I have been part of these uh, for quite a while as a consultant in the past, but also we have done some of these things at, um, at Teach for Lebanon. Uh, these interventions are big, they are heavy, sometimes they are effective. And what we hear uh, and what we experience is that they are not sufficient. Uh, they are sometimes necessary and most of the time not sufficient. Uh, they are amazing because they coincide uh, they coincide with um, the tremendous analytical skills and action orientation uh, that leaders in organizations have. So what, we, what we'd like to do here is to um, add a set of skill. Uh, Marilyn used the word range at the beginning of this talk to increase the range uh, of, this, um, of, of leaders and to increase the range that you might have if you find yourself having to lead change in uncertainty. Now, here's how it works. Um, I'm going to show a slide. Um, thank you, Marilyn. Um, we're looking at the problem of leading change in uncertainty. Now, what's most likely, almost a certainty, is that when there's a problem, that problem doesn't exist on its own. It is not an independent uh, variable that can be fixed. Generally, when there's a problem, it results from an existing dynamic. When there's leading, there must be such a thing as following. When there's a change, there must be something that is stable. Change is compared to a current state, something that is stable, something that might not change. And when there's uncertainty, there must be certainty somewhere. So if you think about this, ta-da, suddenly we're no longer trying to trod the narrow path of solving the problem of leading change in uncertainty. And rather, what we, what we have is we have a field that is broad. It's like a wide avenue. And we want to navigate between those sets of polarities. So when we're, we have the experience of leading change in uncertainty being a problem that needs to be fixed, and I want to invite your awareness to the um, to the fact that we are part of a field where we are always navigating something between a problem and a dynamic. We're always navigating between leading and following. We're always navigating between change and stability. We're always navigating between certainty and uncertainty. The links between those sets of polarities um, are constantly changing. They are, uh, there are things that are updated both by external factor, but also by internal factors to individuals and in relationships and in organizations. Now, when we think about the polarity, uh, just a moment of definition, um, I'm borrowing from Barry Johnson and from Brian Emerson and Kelly Lewis. Um, who wrote the reference books, at least my reference books for uh, thinking and talking and understanding polarities. And the idea here is that the polarity is a set of variables that appear opposed when they are actually linked. Um, the link between them is dynamic. It changes over time and with context. And the resulting outcomes of this dynamic is what we see is what we see in terms of behaviors, in terms of performance, in terms of experience, and in terms of culture. And so the way uh, we'd like to frame today's call is, today's uh, talk is, we want to try to increase the range from looking at a problem that needs to be solved to finding a field where we can find more action, more opportunity, and more creativity. Now, Janine and I have done a little bit of prep for this talk but we purposefully didn't script it. So, um, Janine, I would like to ask you, 
um, and we can now have this uh, conversationally. We don't need the slide. Um, you saw this briefly yesterday, and you've had a tiny bit of time to integrate the idea of the name. Um, you've had a tiny bit of time within our audience. How is it for you to see the issue of leading change in uncertainty framed in this way? Yeah, thank you, Ayub. Um, it's a good question. And I think I, um, I answer it every time uh, from a different perspective. Because uh, when I look at um, uh, the, the frame under which we operate, um, it's changing on a daily basis. And that, that might sound weird um, and not really relatable. But, um, you know, when we had the economic crisis, when we had the financial crisis and uh, people couldn't pick up their check from the bank, we, we thought Lebanon is changing quickly and every three months we have a new Lebanon, a new reality we have to adjust to. And now with um, the war and the escalation of the war, everything changes so dramatically and so much faster. So within two weeks, the number of internally displaced people increased to uh, 1.2 million. And um, we started only with uh, less than 100,000 um, throughout one year. We had around less than 100,000. And then the war escalated and suddenly we had 1.2, 1.4 million people. Um, they all um, took shelter in schools. Uh, obviously also in private homes, and they rented uh, spaces uh, if they could afford it. But um, uh, it's a fact that um, more than 200,000 people are now in the schools, and that's the field where we operate. This is where Teach for Lebanon works. This is where we provide access to education, and um, we had to uh, adjust really, really quickly and um, try to find ways of handling the situation. And um, uh, we adapted the way we do fellowship. So we talked with the principals, uh, we talked with the ministry, we received new permits of working in the shelter. We broadened our definition of who are who is actually our target audience. Because before we looked at the kids in our partner schools and we are now looking at all children which are affected by the crisis and which we can reach in different ways, not only in the school, but also over the hotline, um, not only um, at home via the hotline, but also in the shelter. And um, we are trying our best to say, all children who are affected by the crisis, and I don't think there's any child in this uh, country which isn't affected, um, is now a potential um, a target audience, a potential beneficiary. If we can provide education to that child, we will. So there's a there's a very different new um, uh, approach to it. And, um, and we face so many polarities, right? So we have to see what's our mission, what do we know, what we know best, and what are the resources which come along our way because there's a crisis in this country and international organizations trust us and they offer us, uh, for example, to provide humanitarian aid, but we don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, we have no idea on how to get goods out of the port, uh, without corruption, we don't know how to hire trucks, pack things, and deliver the goods. We know how to do education, and um, we need to see how can we provide immediate relief to all our children, but at the same time develop sustainably. Mm. Yeah, there are so many more you, duality. Um, thank you, Janine. I want to take a moment to just. Um, uh, just rephrase what I heard you say. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm capturing what you're talking about. I might add a little bit of flavor from, uh, from my own experience of Teach for Lebanon. What I'm hearing you say, Janine, is uh, if we go along this frame of the dynamic problem following leading um, stability, change, certainty, uncertainty, what I'm hearing you say is uh, even though you can experience it or we have experienced things as a problem today, it's never one problem and it's never here uh, in the same way. Every day is a new thing that we are facing. 
So there's something around like if we try to solve a problem, the next day a new one will crop up. So if we focus all of our energy on the problem, we're missing out on what is actually happening in the world. I'm hearing Absolutely. you say also that, um, I'm also hearing you say that often we've had things to do in these situations, like we've had to adjust to the changing situations of where the uh, students are and which schools are available. And we have had to follow uh, the, uh, the lead of our partners. Maybe that's something that was not, uh, at least to me, it wasn't very obvious in what you said is, often we have to follow instructions from the Ministry of Education, or we have to follow instruction of security forces, or we have to follow desires of, uh, and the constraints of our uh, fellows and, and our staff. So there's a way in which we think we can influence things, and we are very influenced by things and by, uh, by stakeholders. And in terms of uh, change and stability, uh, we have had to change ourselves. You described earlier how we moved from offering a fellowship to then offering other big programs that are complementary and also in service of our mission. And we're talking about stability. There are things that we don't, we don't know how to do and that we will not change. We teach, uh, we teach students in schools and we train teachers. Uh, so even though the situation may require other things, such as uh, doing administrative work, uh, looking after refugees, such as um, distributing goods or services, this is not what we do. And so we always have to, we are always in a position of making those choices. And sometimes uh, we get, uh, you know, sometimes change is mandated or we feel forced to, to change because of the situation. And sometimes it is incentivized. Uh, you know, sometimes we get a, uh, a lot of encouragement to go in a certain direction and we have to say no, because that's not what we do. And amidst all this uncertainty, uh, I'm hearing you say we have one certainty is that this is what we want to do. And I heard you say a few times, Jenny, not only uh, today, uh, but over the past few days and since I've known you, that we are certain that we are here for a mission. We are here in service of the children. We're here in service of education. And that doesn't seem to be to have changed a lot. And that seems, you know, I, I know that for myself and my colleagues on the board and for you, uh, there's always that certainty that we're doing something in service of the children. And that is the most important thing for us. Does that make sense, Janine, when I when I reframe it in this? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, now that we're there, now that we have a way to see that actually we have more range rather than having to do one thing and to solve for one thing in one time, trot that narrow path, we have a much broader field of action and possibility. What do we do with it? Uh, again, this is something a lot of my clients ask me. They say, okay, this is interesting. I feel better. I feel less stuck, but then I want outcomes. How do we get to these outcomes? Uh, what I'd like to offer here are four competences that are essential to navigating this set of polarities that Janine and I just discussed. Uh, I really want to insist on um, considering these as competences. These are not steps, they are not phases, they are not action points, they are not a recipe. Uh, they are competences that we want to learn, we want to confront to reality, we want to deploy, we want to share, and we want to relearn again and again and again. If we're looking for results, this is not a place where we can promise that you will, if you do, if you practice these competences, these competences at level X, then you will get result Y. This will not work this way. The way this will work is you will keep on deploying these competences and then you will see uh, and check the outcomes and encourage them. A lot of this thinking, a lot of what I'm saying now, uh, for those who like uh, a bit of theory, comes from uh, systems theory. So you can check out uh, systems theory. Uh, uh, Donella Meadows' book is uh, kind of you know at the, at the basis of a lot of that for uh, uh, for some theory and practical applications. But there's a lot of leading in systems that you can see in other references. Uh, so here are the four competences. I'm gonna show them on the slide and I'm gonna walk you through them and then Janine and I will talk about them. Uh, competence number one is tuning in. Uh, this is the competence that allow for a deep and original understanding of the system. So we're always part of some kind of a system. It could be an organization, a community, a relationship, a, um, 
Uh, it could be only a set of people, but it could also involve uh, technology, it could involve objects, it could involve ideas. So you want to really develop a deep understanding of that system. And you want it to be original. And by original, it doesn't mean that we need to create new things. It means that we have to always have a fresh look at that system. Because systems evolve, they change, they're in constant evolution. And so I want to keep looking at them and finding and discovering their aspects. And I understand there's a hidden assumption in what I'm saying, which says that it's, you know, I cannot grasp the full system at any given moment in time in its entirety. But also over time, I cannot keep on grasping it. It's more complex than one individual. Uh, even as I say this, I feel a little bit annoyed that I cannot grab the full system by myself because I, I do have the preference to be able to grab everything and understand everything. But there's also an admission that I don't understand the entire system. So I have to keep tuning in to the uh, um, system or the ecology that I'm part of. Now, uh, the second competence is framing. <clears throat> framing is I want to be able to map the field that I can operate in. And I want to understand the rules of the game that is being played. It's a little bit what Janine and I did earlier. We said leading change in, the problem of leading change in uncertainty is actually not quite a problem that has one solution. And then by laying out the uh, set of polarities that govern uh, leading change in uncertainty, suddenly we framed a field of action and a field of uh, outcomes and behaviors and a field of uh, possibility that is much broader. So the competence of framing is trying to find always what, how much range can I discover? How much range can I elicit in a given situation? And once I have this range, when, once I have the boundaries that I'm operating in, I want to understand what are the rules of the game. I often have a sports metaphor here. So now once I understand the, um, um, the game of soccer, I, think I see the, uh, the field laid out. I also want to understand how that game is played. Uh, not because I always have to play the game as it is, but if I don't understand how it is played, it's really hard to understand how do I how do I play a different game of how do I rewrite the rules of the game. The third competence is the competence of facilitating. Uh, now, I, I you know one of my uh, first languages is French, and facilitating comes from facilitate and from facile, so making things easy. And uh, one leadership competence here is allowing, creating conditions for people to be creative and for outcomes to emerge. There's a way in which uh, a lot of uh, education in critical and analytical thinking, there's a way in which a lot of uh, action-oriented uh, managerial theories zoom in on something. There's a way in which they get things done in a certain way and they're able to measure them. And that misses out on opportunities that can arise creatively uh, when narrowing down doesn't necessarily get us to where we are. So facilitating is allowing people to be creative and outcomes to emerge. And finally, the fourth competence is harvesting. Um, har I like the image of harvesting because it, it, uh, we want to reap the benefits that are coming out of a system. And sometimes they're not benefits. So we want to keep uh, paying attention on, uh, to outcomes. And whenever we can find outcomes that we like, we want to encourage them. And whenever we find outcomes that we don't like, we want to try to regulate them or eliminate them. That's not always possible. But we want to also pay attention to all the outcomes that are desired. And the more we find out the desired outcome, the better it is for us. The more we can tune in again, frame, facilitate, and harvest. So there's a way in which those four competences work with one another. There's a way in which they are uh, dependent on one another. And there there's a way in which we want to uh, learn a lot from them. Now, uh, before going into the details of these four competences, I want to ask you, Janine, when you see those four competences for leading change in uncertainty, um, what do you see? How do they resonate? And which ones are you curious? Which one do you see yourself using? And which one do you see yourself curious about and maybe not, not uh, leaning on enough? Yeah, thank you for that question, Ayub. 
Um, <clears throat> so um, I tried a little bit to see how we are reacting and deploying these kind of skills uh, through the challenges we are facing. And looking at tuning in, even though I know they are not in an order and they are interchangeable and very often we do things at the same time, I start with tuning in. And um, we can tune into the system, which is the educational system in Lebanon, which has been under crisis for a very, very long time. And uh, we do this by uh, being in touch with the ministry, but also by being in touch with the principal, the schools we serve. Um, but most importantly, we try to be in touch with our fellows, so with our young talents, who are uh, our heroes on the ground, because we are planning lots of things for their professional development um, uh, from our comfortable office, but uh, they are the ones who go to the school, who go every day to the school, teach those kids every day, and have to deal with um, their colleagues, the principals, and the really, really challenging conditions they're in. So it's very important for us to understand what moves them and what makes them actually, um, what puts them in a situation that they are best able to serve their mission. What do they need from us so they can do their job? And, um, and so this is really important and we do the same with our team. Um, and when it comes to training and mapping, then we need to take what we have learned from everyone around us, from our ecosystem, um, our immediate ecosystem, which, our, which is our team and our fellows, but also from the wider ecosystem, which is the education system and the political system in Lebanon, then um, uh, I feel we reflected on that a little bit earlier, which is we got many different offers on how to be active during the crisis, but we decided that we stay true to what we know best, so we will stay within our mission, which is providing education. We will not provide humanitarian aid as much as it is needed, but other people will be better equipped to do it. We know best how to do education. And while looking at this question, we also understand that we must be creative and flexible in how we are doing this. So yes, we want to provide access to education, but schools are occupied at the moment from people who really, really need shelter. So how can we bring education to the kids anyhow? We must be flexible and we have um, reviewed our fellowship model and we have um, uh, worked on the marriage, if you want to call it like this, of two different programs. So we have this hotline program, which we mentioned earlier. It's a telephone hotline where students can call a teacher and get help over a prolonged period of time or just for one specific question. And then we have the fellowship. These two programs operate under very, very different conditions. And now I'm trying to frame how can we provide access to quality education for our fellows and for the hotline. But also there's a facilitating moment when I bring those two program teams together. And they are the experts of their program, and they need to come together and solve the puzzle and have the space to solve the puzzle on how to make things work. Um, so I feel this is where I come in as a facilitator um, and who maybe uh, from time to time loops in a feedback and loops in, that's our broader objective, how can we make it happen? And that means that we are meeting very, very often. And um, you asked me where I'm curious. Um, that's the harvesting part, because naturally, um, this is the part where, where I feel we have so many challenges, we, we have to tackle them one by one, once they're tackled, off we go, there's the next one, and um, maybe the harvesting part is not what comes naturally most to me, so pressing the pause button and really appreciating what other people or what we as a um, as an organization have achieved, um, this is something I need to, yeah. uh, and I want to invest more in, yeah. Thank you, Janine. Um, you know, it's, uh, Janine, uh, and for our audience, like I had not heard Janine talk about this before, so I'm, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's so nice to hear you talk about this, Janine, and I'm learning a lot about what uh, TFL is doing by just listening to you. Um, and I'm really appreciating the, the tuning in, the, 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 the keeping in touch with everybody at all times. 
which is extremely energetic and it, which is which is very difficult. And we keep on learning all the time about what's what's going on. And I'm hearing the way you're framing things, such as things that we're invited to and things that we decide, things that we um, uh, things that we choose to focus on and things that we uh, choose to leave to other people. Uh, I, I would like to also add, I see you facilitating things, not only in convening and allowing people to do things and bringing in the experts in the team, but also in uh, reaching outside. We have a partner in an organization called Teach for All, and we're members of, of the network and organization. We reach out to them a lot. We are in constant conversations with our uh, funders, our partners, the big institutions that we work with. And that is another way to facilitate things. Uh, uh, one of our colleagues on the board, Mesa uh, Wadal um, is a very big proponent and encourager to work in uh, in networks and in communities. So we collaborate with other NGOs. So I, I think that all of this is part of facilitating Jenny. And um, mm -hmm. I do agree with you that we may not do uh, the best job at harvesting. This is not a skill that we have practiced very well. <clears throat> and you know, and that one thing that we say is that we've been here for 15 years. We must have very original insights into education in Lebanon, and I would love to share those insights, not only uh, so that we can lean on them, but also so that others can benefit from them, or maybe reject and uh, engage in, in conversation. And that is something that I'd love for us to do a little bit more of. Uh, we had promised uh, everyone that we would uh, that by now we can have a Q and A. So I'm going to ask everybody for maybe a couple of minutes. Because uh, Janine gave us uh, Janine gave us a good path on what those skills look look like. So I'm, I would like to close this call on the last slide, which uh, you know whoever wants to take a snapshot of might be might use it very practically. Uh, so I'd like to to think of those competences in three dimensions, and I will offer the three dimensions of you want to think about deploying those competences individually, either by yourself or helping others having them and then relationally, and then in organizations and communities. And the way it looks like for individuals is tuning in is me developing the uh, awareness to understand my own internal state and the way I operate as a means to have more, um, uh, more ac access to more of my competences and resources. Framing for an individual means I try to go get as many perspectives as I want. Facilitating for an individual is I want to be able to learn. And my colleague uh, Heidi Brooks, who's also a, um, uh, an academic at Yale University, talks about learning from experience. And she has a wonderful uh, um, podcast if you'd like to listen to it. And in terms of harvesting for individuals, I want to keep noticing what is going on for me and for others and naming it and surfacing it. Uh, when we're thinking about relationship, we want to say tuning in is a is a skill of listening and you can see on the website of cultivating leadership but also in so many other places so many different ways to listen in a different way to others we're not only listening to the content and the information we're listening to the person to their sense making framing in a relationship is the idea of being able to surface issue and negotiate positionalities and often that leads us into the facilitation where we want to learn how to have productive conflict and I encourage you to read a, a book by Joe Goodbread on uh, conflict, which is uh, which I find very informative. And harvesting is amplifying the dynamic between two people or a set of uh, relationships to be able to see what is unseen. And finally, at an organizational and community level, tuning in is uh, establishing as many feedback loops as possible at multiple scales. So we want, this is not feedback as in, I'm going to give you feedback on your action. This is what are all the ways in which I can understand my system in all its manifestation. And this could be structural and fixed forever. And this could be also agile and, and moving on. Framing for organizations means trying to invite and bring in as many perspectives as possible and this might be uh, increasing diversity of experiences, of backgrounds, of uh, skills, of expertise, um, and of actions. And facilitating an organization is something you talked about, Janine, which is we want to curate spaces. The, uh, you, know, you might want to read the book, The Art of Hosting, or any way in which you're inviting people, you're convening, 
And your job is to convene, is to invite, is to create the space, and then to allow things to emerge. And so you harvest, you celebrate the good outcomes that you want. So we wanted to leave you with that, uh, with that final uh, set of competences. And we're very happy now to uh, take uh, questions. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Janine. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you, for your intervention. And um, you know how much you put into preparing for this. You guys are beautiful. It's like a very well-rehearsed dance <laughs> to reference the title of our conference. Um, and maybe the way that I'll do this is I have questions for both of you. So maybe I'll do one for each at a time. Janine, I'll start with you. You know, looking at what Ayub has here on the screen, I mean, all of these sound really beautiful and they're very inspiring. Um, help us bring it down to people here. We have a question in the audience about just very small practices, perhaps, that you as a leader yourself um, have applied that perhaps relate to some of these concepts, but that can just feel, you know, familiar to a leader trying to uh, adopt some of these ways of uh, being and leading. <clears throat> Thank you. You know, um, I was uh, I was looking at one uh, thing when we talked about harvesting, and that's not naturally my strong point. Um, and I heard you talking. I was also thinking harvesting means something different for each one of us, uh, depending on where we are in the organization. So, uh, if a fellow harvests um, a successful day, then this is by seeing. Um, the, the the joy in the children by understanding that they had a learning success um, and by by them feeling comfortable with their fellow, which, by the way, is one of our uh, core strengths. When you ask kids, um, what how does the fellow make you feel? They say, I feel seen, I feel cared for, and this is so important in our situation. So for a fellow, harvesting means something really, really different. But for me, for example, Harvesting um, is very often like when do I pause? Um, probably when we have a new grant agreement and um, we, we are able to, um, you know, uh, answer to our target in the budget. But um, uh, there are so many different levels where we actually need to harvest. Um, uh, for example, once we have done an activity successfully and we have reached many people, um, I feel it um, it brings people back to to the mission and it helps them to ignite um, their sense of uh, belonging and uh, really the feeling of community. So um, uh, how can we celebrate more often? I'm very lucky. I have um, uh, really great people in my team who, who remind me um, and who celebrate, they don't wait for me, they, they celebrate their wins. And um, that, that's amazing. And um, um, so I feel everyone uh, uh, being encouraged on talking about not only what needs to be done, but also about what are the challenges I have faced and um, how have we solved them and what successes did we have? Uh, that's a great thing. And um, uh, you can use team meetings for that. You can use um, uh, any kind of community spaces we have. We have, for example, for the fellows an email where they talk about their practices in the classroom. And it is so heartwarming. So there, there are many ways um, whenever you convene as a group um, to, to look at this. And maybe you don't need to steward this always. You can have other people looking at this and, you know, moving it up to, to, to the attention. Beautiful. Thank you so much for, um, for telling us about that and earlier also mentioning some of your other practices around staying connected and tuning in. I think that's something that you do very beautifully uh, towards your entire ecosystem. Um, those are some of the examples that, that you gave us. There are so many more questions. I'm going to give one to Ayub now. Um, and uh, someone in the audience has a question that is somewhat similar to one that I would have wanted to ask you, um, which is, and, and you did talk about it, Ayub, at first, but I want to maybe be a devil's advocate for a second and, and nudge you uh, on that, which is that, of course, a lot of our leadership and management practices 
you know, value things like process, the ability to measure an outcome. Liz mm. talks about this, like what are the implications of setting results and measuring and so on. And um, in my perspective, also sometimes in a crisis, we feel the need to take control. We feel the need to be directive, um, to make decisions quickly, because that's what the context demands. Um, how do you reconcile how we're taught to lead and manage, how we're comfortable for many of us to lead and manage with this more, I don't know if it, if it is slower and you can tell me if it's not, but for sure it is much more facilitative. Um, how do you how do you advise leaders on how to you know, accept uh, those two states? Mm, thank you. Um, I, I saw some of the comments and I'm sorry if I, we don't answer all of them right now. Uh, I love this, this question. I would like to offer... Uh, instead of one answer, you know, a few lenses that everyone can look through. <clears throat> one lens is a lot of my colleagues and I at Cultivating Leadership have been thinking about strategy and complexity. Uh, so my colleagues Zafar Ashi, Jennifer Rabiberger, Jim Wicks, um, and uh, Melissa Clark Reynolds, um, we've been really trying to experiment with how do we uh, how do we make sure that organizations can keep this very strong, very useful skill of strategy and decision-making and uh, be able to approach it in complexity. And so the way we think about this is more that these competencies that I just shared <clears throat> are, an, are not necessarily a replacement for what we're doing, but they are a new lens that we're putting on strategy, uh, on strategy and strategic thinking and decision-making. So we want to be able to approach strategy and do strategy planning but we don't want to do it by only looking at data because, uh, we, uh, because data is by itself limited. And data is limited by, at the very least, by the instrument we're using to measure it. So we want to also integrate a lot of social data and that is the skill of tuning in. We don't want only to, so often we, there are things that we can measure. It's very important to measure. We've seen over the past three years in the corporate world, a huge drive towards performance and return. And uh, often that works. It works uh, a lot for shareholders. We have seen the stock market perform very well in most places, uh, at least in the, in, in the West in the past uh, couple of years. And there's a lot of effects that we cannot see because they are not measurable. And so we forget them, we marginalize them until at some point they become a problem. They may never become a problem, but at some point they do. So uh, uh, I see in my profession that because of this drive towards productivity and performance, uh, managers in organizations are, have less and less time and energy and incentive to actually manage. <clears throat> they have a lot of incentive to produce. And what this leads to is uh, people's experience becoming awful and people's development becoming hindered. So this is a, in the short term, this is very helpful because we are very productive. In the long term, it's much less helpful because productivity is not sustainable. So we want we want those two things to be together. So we want the ability to plan and the ability to feedback on our plan as much as possible. We want to look at data and analysis, and we want to hold it lightly without being subject to the data, but rather use the data so that it's helpful to us. Does that make sense, Marie? That makes a lot of sense, actually. It's about you know, in my if I if I wanted to simplify this, it's about adding more tools to your leadership toolbox, and not just defaulting to the ones that um, are predictive, the ones that feel like we have a sense of control over, but really that's understanding right. that you have to combine. It's another polarity in that sense. Um, right. It's the ability to combine both what you yeah. can sense and what you can measure, and they're not exactly the same thing. Um, that well, actually Martin, segues. I want to say something about this: is that I don't want to minimize the pressure to. That, that puts all of us on one side of that, uh, of that polarity. There's a very strong atmospheric pressure to go on to the measure, data, perform, and plan. I don't want to deny it, but when we over-index on it, we are missing out on a lot of things on the other side. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, another one of my simplifications, but I always say that data can only measure the past uh, and only the part of the past that is very visible or, you know, that goes above the noise and it's our job to sense things beyond that but actually that brings me to a question to janine we also have it here in the audience from mariana and and i was also thinking that earlier and janine i'm so inspired you know when i say 
you guys prepared for this you prepared for this not in the midst of like me sitting in dubai chilling you know having a great life but in the midst of the context that you're presently in i can't imagine the amount of energy and dedication that that took mariana asks you know how do you deal with wanting to give up when you were speaking the questions that were emerging to me was how do you stay grounded how do you keep doing these things how do you i mean the amount of energy that it must take for you to be able to continue doing both of those things in the context that you're presently in. Um, I just wonder if you have any specific personal strategies or a specific way in which you continue to harvest that energy for this. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, we work in uh, such a big uh, ecosystem of so many people and um, they're all driven by taking care of the kids, um, by giving them some form of stability. Um, we have so many fellows who actually um, start to volunteer when um, be before anything happened. Um, and um, so, in general, in Lebanon, we are some we are somehow used to some form of crisis, and we we need to react to it. So um, that that's a given. But how do we stay motivated? Um, honestly, we're in the situation that we can actually make things better. And I believe this is where every one of us takes large parts of uh, motivation um, and, and the drive to get up in the morning and uh, not to leave the country. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I feel this is really the, 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 the common factor for all of us because we are in the position of being able to help and um, each one of us in a different way. So uh, that, that's a driving motivator, that we are not uh, too much um, exposed by what happens in the country, but that we can influence um, how we deal with it and how we react to the crisis and help people to feel better. So I feel um, this is, um, this is, this is my main motivator, and uh, I believe this to be true for, for almost everyone I work with. And um, I can tell you that there's not a single person in our team and in our wider ecosystem which is uh, who's not affected uh, by the escalation of the war. So, um, yeah. Thank you. That's really very beautiful. Yesterday we had a workshop around polarities, and uh, I was facilitating a group around present and future um, and they said something which really um, resonates with what you just said it's it's about being a subject not an object in some ways mm -hmm. and being able to act upon a situation that can sometimes feel completely outside of one's hands is is one really beautiful motivator and of course connecting to the purpose and the greater good of what we do um, is always a great way to ge keep generating endless energy in order to do all of this work which um, you know, more and more falls onto the shoulders of um, of leaders to be complete, to develop their range, to grow, to be better versions of themselves. All of this in the midst of uh, complicated um, scenarios. And as you mentioned, they don't have to be uh, as extreme as what you're experiencing right, down, right now in Lebanon. They could be simpler forms of complexity and uncertainty. And yet still there's so much on the shoulders of leaders. Uh, maybe a question to you is, how do you advise leaders to create, curate their community or how they find their own sources of strength uh, in order to keep being better versions of themselves? Thank you, Marilyn. Um, you know, that's a big question when you ask it. And even if I try to start answering in my mind, I feel already I'm... Uh, have, there's a moralistic fiber in, in, in the question and my answer that I'm, I'm concerned about falling into. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's really hard. A lot of these things are hard. I think leadership is a is not always an easy choice. <clears throat> and some uh, very often it's a privilege and very often it's also very difficult to be in, in that position. Um, about uh, 15 years ago, 12, 12 13 years ago, I, I attended a, a class in business school, and there's this person who's now, I believe, CEO of Nike, at the time he was CEO of eBay, who said, uh, people think that the more power they have as leader, uh, the less support they need. 
and I think of myself differently. I think of myself more as a Formula One car that have, that needs a pit stop every few minutes, and so I get all the support I uh, I can. Um, and you know, I I always re I, I still remember this many years later because I think it's uh, I I find it very wise and it's been very helpful to me. I try to cultivate as much support as I can, uh, you know, from friends, colleagues, family, therapists, from my kids. Um, <clears throat> So that is, a, that is a principle that I like thinking. And if I take that same principle and say, how do I cultivate support for others? And how do I support others to find support for themselves? That for me is one of the nicest ways of uh, building community. Thank you. I really love that. I always uh, tell the people who we work with that the people who hire coaches are athletes. <laughs> and I think it's you know very similar to what you're saying. And actually, the the more power you have, the more also in some ways it is your duty to seek out support so that you can leverage um, that power and that capacity towards something that is meaningful and important. So thank you so much for saying that. Um, I know we're a little bit over the hour. There are a few more questions in the chat, but perhaps we can go back and answer them uh, in writing, just wanting to respect everybody, including your time. I know we've uh, taken you a little bit overboard here. Um, but I really want to thank you for how inspiring today was. Um, thank you so much for all the hard work you put into bringing that. I think, you know, these different uh, polarities that you raised and the tools that you've shared, you know, that final table, we could spend hours unpacking each little box in that table and certainly learn a lot. And thank you for all the resources that you um, shared with us and that we've paid forward to the audience. Uh, Janine, thank you so much for joining us um, today and um, you know sharing with us how you're leading. It's a very inspiring um, you know moment of discovery and connection. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Of course. And as always, a little bit of gratitude to our attendees who've given us you know a little over an hour of their time and a lot of their great questions, and to the team at Cosmic Centers for making all of this stuff happen. Um, this video will be available for you guys to rewatch it. I certainly think I'm going to be rewatching it many times because it's the kind of conversation that has so many layers that you might discover a different thing every time you listen to it. Uh, so you'll find it on our website, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, wherever you prefer to consume your content, even in podcast format in a few minutes. Um, and for more insights on this topic, of course, we have a few more sessions planned um, throughout this week and next week online. You can find all of the programming uh, on the conference website, which we'll link for you in the comments or subscribe to our newsletter. And in our next session, I'll be speaking to Matt Barlett Bond, who is part of a global research initiative focused on understanding workplace burnout and driving sustainable growth. And we'll be unpacking what they've learned about mastering sustainable performance and how polarities can help. So join us right here um, next Wednesday, November 13th at 4.30 p.m. UAE time. And thank you again for being with us. We hope to see you at the next one. Janine left. <laughs>